Hello and welcome to the fourth episode in our Quad Build Series 4. Now if you're new to quadcopter building and you've never done one before or you've only done one before, this might be a little bit advanced because we're not covering each of the steps in detail, we're skipping over a few because this series is really about the Betaflight F3 flight controller, this frame and also adding high definition FPV bits and pieces too. If you're interested, you can go and watch the first and second series of quadcopter building for beginners and all of the steps are covered in far more detail in there so if you're a new pilot go and have a look at those they're probably more appropriate. For those of you that are still with us then in this video what we're going to do is first of all talk about what we've done between the last video and this one because as you can see there are a couple of changes to the flight controller. We'll also then go through the receiver setup. A couple of things to consider here. We're using the XM Plus micro receiver, and as you can see, we've connected the wires up here, but I want to talk about a couple of things with that. Then we'll talk about what we've done to prep the other data pins for the other pieces that we might connect to the flight controller later, specifically the Mavlink connection to the Connex system. Then we'll finish building out the frame once we're confident that everything's all put together. And then finally, we'll get ready for the next video where we'll finish the setup, go through the BL heli bits and pieces and do our test hover. And that should leave us with one more in the series to go through the Connex system. So let's go back to the start of this video then and talk about what we've actually done. Now this board is slightly different from where we left it last time. There are some extra pieces that we've soldered onto here. If we turn it over, you can see that we have connected the voltage for the receiver to the five volt pin on the bottom. And we've also connected the voltage out or the RAM pin to VBAT if we were going to use traditional FPV technology. Now we talked about those two pins and what they did earlier on in the series, but that's the last bit of soldering that we needed to do underneath. We've also connected up pins to the UR2 and also the signal pins of UR3 and hardwired the cables that are going to connect the XM+. Again, it's the S bus receiver here, so we've connected it up to these first four pins. I've also taken the liberty of installing a wire onto the telemetry connection. However, using an XM+, I'm going to show you a little trick. We don't need to worry about that we can use channel 16 on the XM Plus because the RSSI value is automatically output on that channel for us and it's a piece of cake to set it up in Betaflight and have that information displayed on our on-screen display or sent back to us on a telemetry system. So let's talk about how we've connected the XM Plus and got this guy all ready to be used. Now the first thing we've done of course is we've got our, our trusted Tyrannus radio, we've created a model with the four standard controls, throttle, elevator, aileron and rudder and two additional switches as well, one for modes and the other for arming. Once we did that, then we've connected up the XM Plus to the pins that we've just had a look at. So ground, power, and the signal pin. And again, we've also connected the telemetry one, although I don't think I'm actually going to end up using it. With that wiring done, as per the diagram that we had a look at earlier in the series, then it's time to jump into Betaflight. So here we are connected to the board inside Betaflight. I have Flash the board with version 3.1.7, which is the latest beta flight as I'm recording this video. And one of the things you'll notice if I go into the ports configuration is that UART2 is actually being used for the serial receiver. Now, normally in a flight controller like this, almost every other one that I've ever built, it's usually UART3 that is dedicated to handle the serial connection for an S bus or an I bus or a satellite receiver. In this flight controller on 3.1.7, I'm being forced to use UART2. If I try and turn UART2 off and enable the serial receiver via UART3, it simply isn't working. So here I've had to select UART2 as the UART that I'm going to use for my serial connection. And that means that UART3 is the one that's going to be available for me to configure with a Mavlink protocol that I'll need to talk to the on-screen display bits and bobs in the Connex system. With it set like that on UART2, if I go into the receiver, and the nice thing here is that the receiver has been powered by the 5 volt connection from the USB, so we don't have to apply any other power to the flight controller. If I jump into the receiver bits and pieces and move the sticks, you can see them all moving, which is great. The other cool thing is you'll notice that channel 16 is bouncing around. That is actually the RSSI value exposed directly via that channel to the flight controller. 
So if we go up here and select the RSSI channel as channel 16, then when I go back into the main config screen on the right hand side, you can see my RSSI value is being shown. Now the thing is with the XM Plus is it doesn't have any two directional telemetry on board so you don't get things like the battery voltage and stuff being displayed on your Tyrannus radio and if you turn the model off before you turn the radio off you don't get those alerts about telemetry being lost. So, but this is a really cute little way with this 10 11 pound receiver for us to get our on-screen display RSSI information with just one click of the mouse in the receiver tab. Don't forget while you're in here to check and set up your failsafe and also make sure that if you do turn the radio off that the failsafe levels drop back to where you want them to be so in the event of a hiccup with the radio connection then you're not going to get caught out. We have a video about the failsafe options in here so if you're not sure how all this failsafe stuff works you can go and watch that. So now we've seen how the receiver's connected let's talk about the other data pins that we've got connected on the board itself. I've put some pins here in place so we can connect the external LEDs. I haven't put any yet over here for the buzzer, but we may. Because I've got myself on these little Matek all-in-one 6 LED and buzzer units, and if I can find a place to put it on the chassis when it's a little bit more built, I'd like to wire everything up. I do like having LEDs and a buzzer on a model like this in case it comes down in long grass or gets stuck in a hedge or something. I have a much better chance of finding it with lights and a buzzer on the top. Also, these pins here were actually wired before I realized that UART2 had to be used for the serial receiver. If I wasn't going to be using these, I wouldn't have wired them in. They're a little bit redundant now, although it does give me an option to connect something that needs 5 volts and ground to these pins and use them for power for something. One of the things I will mention here is how difficult it is, unless you have a really good soldering iron, to actually solder up the ground pins on this board. The ground plane on this board is massive, so the track that connects all the ground pieces together is really chunky and it acts like a big heat sink. So unless you're using a very good soldering iron with a nice hot tip, then you're going to struggle to get your soldering in here. What I'd recommend, just like we talked about in the last video, make sure that you're soldering all of the signal and plus 5 volt pins and those pieces first. Get the board a little bit warm before you have a go with the 5 volt pin. You may find that you actually need to switch to a slightly larger tip that can get the heat into the ground pin so you, that you can actually wire everything up. Because I need UART3 for my Mavlink uh, and at this point everything else was on the board, I am going to have to cheat here. I've just connected the receive and transmit pins which are the ones that I could squeeze on onto UART3 which is here at the bottom and that is what I'm going to connect the two transmit and receive pins that go up into the connex so I can send my Mavlink data. So now we've got to this stage, the next thing to do then is go and build the frame. So I need to get the arms out and attach those. I need to make sure that everything's snugged down onto these anti-vibration mounts. I need to probably get the voltmeter out, just double check before I start putting too much of this stuff together that I haven't shorted anything out, particularly between the positive and negative terminals of the battery connection. Just go around each of the solder joints and make sure that you haven't accidentally bridged something you didn't mean to. I'm going to attach the motors onto the arms. Be aware that these motors are the kind that are designed to turn in one particular direction, either clockwise or counterclockwise. That way, if the nuts start to get a little bit loose, then they won't spin off into the air. Make sure that you're putting them in the right position and obviously refer back to that image of the quadcopter to see which way they go around. So let me put those pieces together, put the motors on the arms, solder them onto the ESCs and then put the top plate on and we'll come back and we'll have a final look. So this is where we've got to in this video. We now have the receiver connected, we have all the pins and we have this little guy pretty much configured, ready to rock and roll to do the final setup in Betaflight and our test hover in the next video. So join me in the next video where we're going to do the final checks. We'll check the accelerometer and calibrate everything. We'll check the motors are running okay. We'll check that the receiver is still happy. We might have a quick play with BL Heli and I will certainly have to reverse one if not two or more of these motors around. If there's time in the next video, we'll also have a look at potentially adding the special BL Heli S firmware onto the speed controllers as well. Might be nice to have the Imperial March playing. 
And then finally, at the end of the next video, we'll go for a test hover. And then that's the point where we can come into the last video and start putting the Connex bits and pieces on the top, ready to try some high definition FPV. Thank you for taking the time to watch that video. We try and release at least two videos a week, usually a quick tip on a Tuesday and a more in-depth video on a Friday. And sometimes we manage to get a few more out as well. If you're interested in radio control, then the playlists are useful to have a look at. Anything that's called Introduction To is an organized set of videos that teach you from first principles about the subject that you're interested in. But we also have information about the majority of popular open source flight controllers, how to build quadcopters, fixed wing models, reviews, setups, unboxing, all kinds of things in here as well. So if you haven't already had a look at the playlist, then I'd recommend going have a look through here to see if there's anything that takes your fancy. Finally, we do also provide updates through things like Twitter, Instagram, and also post all of our 3D designs on Thingiverse as well. So if you like what we're doing here on YouTube, have a look at those things and subscribe to us there, and you'll find out what we're up to in advance of the videos coming out here on the channel.